Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's your host, Anthony Pagnata, with you guys as always. And today, we continue our Tar Heel offseason interview series with a former Tar Heel from the late John Bunning era into the early Butch Davis era. It is Tremaine Goddard, uh, the guy who set up what was an extremely successful run in the secondary for the Tar Heels in the late 2000s. He's joining us here on the Heel Tough Blog podcast. And first of all, Tremaine, uh, again, you know, it's it, it, I say this uh, just about every time when I open up with people, I always like to check. You know, we're coming out of, you know, a, 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 por- a portion of life uh, that we pretty much no, no one could have expected here over the last uh, year and three months. So, you know, first of all, how's the family holding up uh, during everything with COVID and uh, now that everything's sort of getting back to normal? Uh, family's holding up good. Um, mom actually uh, recently had COVID and she's she's fully recovered. Um, I've been working in healthcare uh, in the nursing home, so I've been in the midst of the pandemic for the last uh, last year. But things are opening back up. Um, COVID rates are going down. Uh, health is good. You know, lots to be thankful for. Well, it's good to hear, man. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit more probably about that later. I'm sure. Uh, let's you know go back though and and talk a little bit about your career first at Carolina. Um, you know, first of all, you come from uh, you know Roanoke, North Carolina. Uh, you know, how did you end up at, at Carolina? You know, because I, I think that you know people think back to your career, they think that you ended up there under Butch Davis, but you were actually recruited there by John Bunning. And, and one of the things that I always like to ask with Coach Bunning is, you know, when he recruited you, was the fact that he was able to sell the experience of having been a player there a big part of why you wanted to commit to Carolina? Uh, it played a little factor in. Um, back during my early recruiting stages, I grew up, you know, wanting to go to Florida State, um, you know, dual sport. And, uh, you know, we started getting the recruitment process. And, uh, you know, Coach Blaine came to a few basketball games. He was always in the area, always calling. And then uh, Ken Browning got into the mix. And uh, Ken Browning pretty much single-handedly changed the whole landscape. And, you know, it was just like, <clears throat> just like talking to a father. Um, he was very sincere. Um, he was all about life lessons. Um, uh, you know, he didn't blow smoke up you like some recruiters did. Um, you know, just because you're a high ranking player, they you know say the you know the dream boat. He was just down to earth and just kept it real and raw, and it was something that was pretty impressive to see. Um, and he uh, had me turn to want to be part of you know the the change at UNC. So, I think combination of John Button and also uh, Ken Browning really turned the tide for the heels for becoming the long. 
Well, let, let's go back to 2005, your sophomore season. Uh, you know, you started the last six games at Strong Safety, and that first start came in the game against Virginia. What do you remember about that moment before that game when they told you that you were going to be a starter? And, you know, what, what, what was that like, uh, knowing that you were going to be starting in, in what is, uh, what most people don't realize, the South's oldest rivalry? Yeah, in my mind, I was thinking it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that game, I believe we won 75. We got a safety. Uh, uh, we took a, David Woodridge took a uh, safety with the punt just to uh, end the game. Uh, remember, uh, they had a heavy 12-package uh, tight end cross and a lot of play action. Uh, I think it was Marquise was the quarterback, uh, short, fast, quick guy. So, you know, we had a really strong, strong game plan. Um, they had a lot of play action, a lot of power um, running. So, for the first start, it's pretty – Pretty simple uh, install playbook to learn, and I remember having several pass breakups. I remember missing a sack, and you know they always say you don't jump for his pump fake, and I went for it. And he came inside and missed the sack. Um, but yeah, it was it was an awesome game. Like we we just really dominated the game. It was a low scoring game, and you know the defenses on both teams got to really shine that day. Yeah, and and uh, you guys, that that was a team in Virginia coming into that 2005 season that was ranked 23rd in the country, and uh, you guys did a great job in that game. Uh, yeah, and a tremendous showing for you as well. Um, you know, you you move on into the Butch Davis era, and you know, what was the difference that you saw most notably between him and, and Coach Bunning? Because it felt like you know that that was that there were some really big transitions in, in coaching from back in the day, Bill Dooley to Dick Crum. But I feel like the the one that had the biggest difference in, in terms of their coaching style may have been Coach Bunning to Coach Davis. Is that something that you you realized as well when Coach Davis took over? Uh, yeah. You know, uh, you know, Coach Bunning and his staff um, you know, hats off for you know, bringing a lot of guys in that you know, transition over to uh, Coach Davis' team. Um, you know, I think we had some – we had tremendous talent. We just had, you know, the, the, the word most football coaches hate is MO and missed opportunities. You know, we had a lot of opportunities to really do some really good things and, and not be like an elite team, but, you know, above average, um, you know, continuing that trend. And I think there were some internal struggles with, you know, a little bit of uh, coaching staff, a little bit of trust being lost with some players, um, uh, some cancerous components on the team from a, from a player standpoint. And I think just um, the combination of all of that, and then, you know, we had a couple of injuries. Um, I think that really turned the tide. And I think one of the things that really hurt, you know, our team uh, was uh, my sophomore year or freshman year uh, when uh, we, we ended up beating NC State. And then, you know, the following week we lost, you know, Chris Walkman, he was the leading the, the league in tackles. Derek Bowman leading the, the team in uh, receptions. Mm-hmm. Mike Mason. So we lost some some huge weapons on both sides of the ball. And when you're that level of a program, you, you need depth. And we didn't have depth, so we didn't have you know the horses to replace that. And um, and I think just taking that that loss after that big win, they just you know just triple down, and then the following year, um, you know. Uh, you know, we made some strides, and then that third year, uh, we just kind of got depleted. And you know, I think everyone remembers that Clemson game, and you know, sitting on the sideline, and you know, we were just outgunned, and it just felt like the, the breaking point for the team. So, um, you know, it was like new life when Coach Davis came on the team, and you know, this is his background, and you know, being with Miami, and uh, you know, his NFL connections, uh, and then just the staff that came assembled. Um, you know, it was just more of a rejuvenation for the team. And, you know, philosophy changed some, but, you know, it wasn't a lot of philosophy change. It was, just, you know, more of a, a system change of you know, how we operated, how we ran drills, how we ran, um, you know, the off season, And it was just those small things that really uh, set the tone for the season starting. So you go to your senior season, um, And I want to start by asking you about the season as a whole. You know, you finish with seven interceptions, which was tied for the most in the nation. And you did it out of a safety spot, which I don't think, you know, most people would think a guy that has seven interceptions in a season, it's going to be a lockdown corner. But you did it from the safety spot. 
What do you think allowed you to be that successful that season and help lead uh, a Carolina defense that uh, is definitely one of the more underrated in Tar Heel program history, that 2008 group? Yeah, I mean, we had some some ballers on that team. You know, we had, you know, a uh, linebacker that was faster than the entire secondary, uh, Bruce mm-hmm. Carter and, and Zach Brown, um, Ed Kwan, we had, you know, uh, you know, Richard Quinn or Robert Quinn. Um, I know, you know, there's things about that, but, you know, incredible player. We had like a lot of pieces around the team. And I think uh, for those younger players, having some, you know, players like myself and Mark Pascal, um, and, and being able to really teach the game uh, from our experience and things that's going on. And I think for myself, uh, the prior year, I, I played, but you know, I was still recovering from, you know, not really not having one year to the purple foot twice in one year. And, you know, as close to healthy as I could be uh, my senior year. And I think that helped my confidence quite a bit. And, you know, just being in the film room, you know, Deontay Williams, Kendrick Brain, Charles Brown, Jordan Henby, all those guys, you know, we was up 6 o'clock in the morning uh, watching film, um, you know, just teaching guys how to watch film and, and you know, how to look at tendencies. And then when the coach is bringing install, you're taking all those components and went out there and we just played. So, um, senior year, was, it, was a, it was a blast. Um, it was awesome. You know, we won eight games. Um you know, really to achieve more, but you know, coming from where we're at, you know, it was it was also great. So, and you know, just take it back to your question as a safety. Um, I think just that film study and preparation. Um, you know, I still remember the concepts like yesterday, like Boston College ran dice route. Um, you know, curl flat over the over the, over the middle. Quarterback reach left. He's coming back. Um, you know, playing Notre Dame. Uh, can't really remember his name, but he always liked to look the opposite direction he was going. They also had an answer to that, you know, we can take, um, you know, in the middle of the game, just, you know, taking trains and stuff like that. So you just take all that information and, and just apply it in. Um, you know, strong safety, but, you know, with Deontay Williams, um, you know, he's a, he's a free safety, but, you know, we play interchangeable roles. So that put me in more coverage, or not more coverage, put me in coverage situation, put him in coverage situation. So, you know, him in the middle third covered a lot of ground and, you know, me coming out in the box for the run or you know, tight end or slot receiver. Um, and it sounds like burning, just uh, the ball wasn't thrown. But I think collectively as a unit, you know, we really fed off each other. Yeah, well, let me ask you specifically about a couple of games from that season. I think the one that most people will will remember and want to start with is that game against Notre Dame. And, you know, I, I think the biggest thing that I wanted to ask you first about that, and then we'll get to your individual performance, what was the mindset in the locker room for that game? Because, uh, again, Carolina came in uh, as the ranked team. Notre Dame was not having a great season. That was uh, under Jimmy Clausen after Brady Quinn had departed campus, so Jimmy was still young um but you guys had to roll out cam sexton in that game that wasn't the original plan so what was the mindset like in that locker room was it one that we can still get this job done and maybe you guys on the defensive side needed to step up to help do that or 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 what else were were you guys saying before that game uh at the time against a team that carolina had never beaten before we were confident going to that game. You know, we know historically Notre Dame. Um, we also had a few uh, old heads on the team um, that went down in 2006 uh, down in South Bend and been on the sideline and not being able to play and, you know, uh, going through that that loss and them coming to our house night game. Uh, we were pumped. And Cam Sexton was the four-star quarterback coming into Carolina. So, you know, he was no slouch. We knew he had a lot of ability. Uh, we had confidence in him. Uh, my defense was ready for the challenge, you know. Jamie got a lot of accolades and, you know, strong arm, but, you know, decision-making was one of his weaknesses. You know, you can disguise and camouflage things. And, um, you know, so we came to the game prepared and, like, ready to play. So both sides of the ball, we had no doubt that, you know, we could – that we had no doubt that we were going to come out victorious. Um, and, you know, it doesn't show because of – or didn't show because of historically how UNC has been. Um, but, you know, we had no doubt for that game. We, we prepped hard that week and – um, bring a lot of zone coverages. Um, you know, it, it was a fun. It was a fun game. Well, you recovered the fumble on Notre Dame's final offensive play of the game. So, how great did that feel for you to be able to jump on top of that fumble and seal what was, you know, at the time uh, pr- probably one of the bigger wins for Carolina, considering who the opponent was and and that fact that they hadn't beaten them uh, before that 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 game. Yeah, I uh, still remember, uh, you know, it's like fourth and 15, uh, fourth and long, and uh, they ran a post route, and, you know, we were pretty deep, the safeties, and, you know, I kicked myself uh, in the butt because, 
Um, I saw the crosser coming for the skinny post, and I could have easily went up, knocked it down, and intercepted it. But I was also worried that, you know, he had a strong run. I didn't want to get beat by a post route coming on the other side by jumping around and one of my boys going there like uh, Maryland in 2005. Um, so when I came in, the tackle was made, and the ball came out, you know, just, you know, ran and uh, slid to, you know, keep the ball from jumping from under me. And uh, everything went to review, and the game was over. But it was pretty exciting in that game because it had been pretty heartbreaking, especially with some young players on the team to fight that hard and have a game slip away from us like that. So it was very satisfying for, you know, everyone on the team. Well, look, that that was a tremendous moment. There was another one later in the year as well for you against the rival Duke Blue Devils. You know, 27 seconds on the clock. Duke is driving the field into Carolina territory. Everybody talks about that interception that Chad Surratt had a few years ago to prevent Duke from winning that game in uh, Keenan Stadium. You had this interception against the Blue Devils in the 2008 season uh, with 27 seconds to go. What do you remember about that? And, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming that had to be a special moment, even though it was on the road uh, and not at home. Uh, I mean, every senior that plays at UNC, uh, they don't want to lose to Duke, NC <laughs> State, Wake Forest, or Wake Forest, as we call them. Um, we don't want to take any of those losses. Uh, you know, last year, the younger enough opportunity. So, getting that moment um, and getting that interception and, you know, it's you know, they're trying to make a play and just reading the quarterback guys making that play and then uh, uh, you know I wanted to run it back and probably do something pretty reckless but you know he had an angle and just wanted to secure the win so you know went out of bounds and uh, you know that time you know you're not supposed to keep footballs and I ran across the field like I didn't hear the umpire the back of the lady put the ball away so I still have that football to this day um, and it, it was it was incredible it was incredible so uh, you know you're, you conclude just a, a tremendous career at Carolina. You're still top five in career interceptions. Um, you know, it's, it's, you tied for third most in a single season in Carolina football history. But where has life taken you since? Uh, you talked a little bit about being, uh, you know, helping uh, during the pandemic and everything like that. W- where has, has life taken you since, uh, you know, your time on the football field has concluded? Yeah, so I spent uh, probably about nine years in Maryland. Um, in 2011, I uh, trained for a couple of years for NFL um, and, you know, just wanted to move forward with my career. So I moved up with some family up in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. Um, and then, you know, just continued through, uh, get my master's degree over at Howard University and uh, background social work. So I just went from there and got into healthcare and long-term care uh, as a social work and then just continue to work my way through it. Um, end up uh, becoming an administrator. So I'm actually in Illinois right now. I run a facility um, that's in Illinois. So I was in Maryland uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. So um, it's it's been a it's been a it's been an incredible journey. Um, you know, just being able to transition and do something that really is impactful for others. You know, working with our senior geriatric population. Uh, you know, you know, just like on the football field where you know. You're the captain, you're you know, getting people motivated, you're trying to put people in the right place to make the right decisions. Um, you know, policy change, you know, in a split second, you know, from whether it's from C D T or Center Medic or Medicaid services and you have to adjust everything. Um, so a lot of football train transfers right over. So uh, I enjoy what I do. Um, especially during this time of pandemic where nursing home is pretty hard in the early stages. Um and, you know, there's things that's out of nursing home control um, in the initial phase of lack of resources and PPE and those type of things. And just how, you know, you get abundance of whatever you need now. And there's vaccine that's, that's, that's out that's, you know, helping bring the uh, COVID rate, uh, positivity rate down. Um, and just, you know, people, uh, you know, practicing better uh, touch control protocol. So it's, it's a rewarding uh, career path. Um, you know, it's a lot of a lot of work that goes into it, a lot of preparation. Uh, but I get to work with people, I get to help make change, and I get to do what I love. So, no complaints on my end. 
Well, I think I say it for everybody that listens to this podcast, all the Tar Heel fans out there. Thank you uh, for what you do, helping in the nursing homes, everything like that. I know it's definitely had to have been a real tough time for you, and we uh, we really appreciate you telling us a little bit about that and a little bit about your Tar Heel career. Hey, Tremaine, thanks for stopping by with us, man. Uh, this was tremendous. Always like getting the former players on. Uh, you were uh, one of those guys that when I was first getting into Tar Heel football that I uh, had to follow week in and week out. You were one of those guys that always seem to be showing up on the screen. Uh, one of those guys that you took pride in, in, in being able to tell your friends about and brag about when you were in middle school. So uh, thanks for stopping by with us, man, and uh, you know, taking a little time to talk about your career. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for having me, Anthony. And just want to get a special shout-out to my high school coach, Johnny Kiefer. Um, you know, he had us on a collegiate lifting program in high school, and, you know, before Huddle and all these new technologies, uh, just driving around and sending out tapes everywhere and you know, coming from a small one-day school just really put me on the map. So I, I can't say enough uh, about Donnie Keeper for what he's done to you know, help me get to where I'm at right now. Yeah, and you got us a really good defensive back and a guy that Carolina fans will remember for a very, very long time. So uh, thank you again for stopping by with us, man. Uh, take care, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you down the line. All right, brother? All right, you too. Thanks, man. All right, man. So that is Tremaine Goddard stopping by with us, former Toriel defensive back. And, uh, yeah, he was a good one, man. He was a really good one in that Butch Davis era. Um, and, you know, a guy that, uh, again, we can't say enough, you know, about these people that have been working on the front lines over the last year and three months now. Uh, it has been just uh, – it, it has been just a, a crazy time. There have been, you know, a lot that everybody has been going through, but I can't imagine being one of those people on the front lines and having uh, to see some of the stuff that they probably had to see firsthand with this virus. So, uh, th- thank you so much for, uh, you know, a- everything that you guys do. Anybody, any first responders that are listening to this, if Tremaine Circum back and listening to this as well, thank you so much for all that you guys do. So, uh, that's another interview in our interview series. Uh, again, we've got plenty of them coming up. Make sure that you guys are tuning in and checking all of these out over uh, the next couple of weeks and 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 it could you know it really just depends we'll see how successful it is uh, going forward it has been extremely successful so far and uh, you know I think the other thing is going to be uh, you know it, how much time we actually have to continue to do these as we go further and further into the summer towards football season but we're going to continue this for the majority of the summer for the months of of June and July this will definitely be a feature that we're going to be doing so make sure that you guys are staying with us. We're lining up a bunch of great guests. Uh, we, you know, just had Ricky Barden on in our last episode. Another Tar Heel defensive back. He is a guy from, you know, the uh, the late seventies, early eighties. So you can see how we're kind of spanning it across the multiple generations of Tar Heel football. Uh, and, and there's plenty of other guys that you guys can go back and listen to. One of Tremaine's former teammates, Kendrick Bernie, has stopped by with us. You can go check that edition out as well as. As, uh, you know, a couple other guys, Bill Spann on the offensive line, a couple of the o- other older guys, uh, you know, from the Bill Dooley era. He's from the Bill Dooley era. You've got uh, former Tar Heel offensive lineman Pat Crowley from the late Dick Crum into the early Mac Brown era. So uh, there's a ton of stuff that you guys, uh, you know, a ton of guys that we've talked to uh, that you guys may have missed. Make sure you go back, check out those editions of the podcast, and we got plenty more coming up for you, as we said. Uh, when it comes to, you know, the in-season stuff and the recruiting stuff, we're still going to have that for you here. We got a new edition of the podcast that's going to come out. Me and Josh, we're going to do a fun edition of the podcast uh, where we are going to have a specific topic. We're going to give you a top five list. Make sure that you guys uh, are keeping an eye out for that. I'm not going to tell you what the top five list is going to be about, but I think it's going to be a fun topic. It's going to be one that you guys are going to want to get involved in. And uh, I think the day before before we are about to record, we will go ahead and put that out. Uh, or maybe the day that we are recording, we may go ahead and put that out uh, for you guys. So make sure that you uh, are keeping an eye uh, on the social media feeds for that. We'll go ahead and plug those here. Uh, the Heel Tough blog on Facebook is the best way to find everything and including the question that we will post for you guys um, to, to give your responses. It is Heel Tough blog on Facebook. Uh, of course, uh, check us out out over on Twitter as well at Heel Tough Blog on Twitter for my personal uh, Twitter page it's at HTB Anthony Josh is at HTB Josh and then Zach Hubbard almost said his 
Twitter handle as his name, is HackZubber2 on Twitter. He is our recruiting guy, of course. Uh, and we're going to have you know a, a whole bunch of stuff going up there, a bunch of articles uh, on the website, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, we'll have all those video editions of the podcast for you. We're coming back with uh, an, you know actual on-video editions of the podcast once we get a little bit closer to the season. I don't know if we're going to do the one that we're supposed to do next, the, the, the top five list. I don't know if we're going to do that on camera. I, I haven't really decided yet. I think that might be a big enough one that we could do it on camera, um, but we'll just have to wait and see if we have that capability yet. I know we are getting the studio back for uh, the upcoming season, but I'm not sure if we'll be able to get in there and do some of those right now. We'll have to just wait and see. Um, but if we are, we'll have that up there. Uh, if not, we still do the waveform editions of the podcast, which have been extremely popular as well. Uh, so you guys can check that out. And then uh, the regular editions of the podcast also are posted on there uh, in the meantime. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, with uh, you know those articles that we talked about uh, on the website. Uh, you know, go there, heeltoughblog.com. We've got some great coverage uh, right now with all of the guys that are on campus. Bunch of official visits, unofficial visits. Carolina is hitting the recruiting trail hard uh, because this is going to be one of the craziest months in recruiting history on both the uh, basketball and football fronts. I've got you covered with football. Uh, we've got a bunch of official visitors on campus uh, the, this weekend that we're recording this. Uh, we'll put this out probably midweek. So uh, this weekend, and, and there should be, you know, if there are any updates, they should be up on the website right now. Uh, that You know, there's a bunch of uh, big names that are on campus right now, and then uh, we do also have uh, you know a bunch of guys that are going to be coming throughout the month that will be unofficially visiting. The biggest one of those was on the first of the month and the second. He actually ended up staying two days in Zach Rice, so uh, we'll have that. And uh, we are going to provide some updates in the next edition of the podcast as well. Um, but uh, we will also, of course, have you covered on the blog site. That's where we go a little bit more in depth with everything. Thing, uh, you know, including you know the scouting reports that we do on all the guys. Those are you know something that is going to be guaranteed during this time is that all the guys that are officially visiting campus, we have scouting reports for them. If we don't already, we're writing them up right now, and we'll put them up whenever they are getting ready to head to campus. Uh, so you know, of course, this past weekend, Jake Pope was on campus, the four-star safety. You got Sebastian Chiefs, the four-star outside linebacker, uh, as well as. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, four star um, blanking now on who uh, the five star cornerback Jaden Lucas who is up there as well. You guys can check all three of those out. Zach Rice has one up there. We did uh, he he was an unofficial visitor, but we felt he was big enough to uh, write one up about. That's on the website as well. There's a ton of stuff up there for you guys to check out. And uh, the basketball side of things, Josh has he covered with the Will Shaver commitment. Uh, he has an article up about that that sort of describes what kind of what kind of player Carolina is getting. Uh, we'll of course be doing a podcast on that one. So the website you can check that out at the top of the page. That's where the links to uh, the podcast feeds are. Four Corners podcast is up there right next to the Heel Tough Blog podcast. So you guys can check that out. We'll be recording that on Monday. So that's uh, extremely exciting. Actually, at the time that this is put up, that should be up there. Uh, so you guys can go ahead and go back and check that out. Uh, and yeah, uh, he'll be of course covering all of the news and information that's coming out. He'll have you updated on that as we go throughout the next three or four weeks uh, as Carolina uh, hitting a crucial moment. It's really throughout all of college sports. Carolina is hitting the recruiting trail hard and, and on the basketball side of things, it's a crucial moment to get off to a good start for Hubert Davis. So he'll have you covered on those fronts. Uh, podcast, make sure you subscribe uh, to the podcast uh, wherever you guys are listening to. If you listen to it on any of those apps, uh, the Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, any of those, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any of the upcoming editions. So that wraps it up for this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. I want to thank Tremaine Goddard for stopping by with us. I want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, go Tar Heels! Go Tar Heels!